Yeah, you gotta turn the music off first, Stephen. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Somebody's doing good. I think it was just Chris. But. Well, I'm super excited to worship with you guys this morning. And I just had a little something I felt like I wanted to share with you. Um, just an encouragement. Um, Yeah, just to not let the distractions keep you from what the Lord has for you today. So I woke up in the middle of the night on Friday night, and I just laid there for a while, um, wondering what time it was, trying to go back to sleep. I'm, I don't know if you guys ever have that happen, but. Um, and finally, I'm like, okay, maybe the Lord, because I couldn't go back to sleep. Maybe the Lord woke me up for a reason, because he does that sometimes. And... Um, Anyways, I just wanted to encourage you, if that happens to you, just, you know, like uh, Samuel in the temple, we say, speak, Lord, I'm listening. Um, I think he does that in the middle of the night for me because he knows that any other time, I've got so much going on, um, and that's the time when I don't have any distractions. And it just got me thinking, how often do I miss out on those times because I'm distracted, because... Um, the world is distracting me because of the busyness of life. And when all I need is him, all we need is more of him. Amen. Um, Isaiah 64, 8 says, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. We are the work of his hand. Peter wants me to have a light. Um, <laughs> we're the work of his, his hand and man I need him to mold me and shape me and I'm sure you guys feel the same way to guide me and lead me where he wants me to go and I can't do that if I'm not taking the time to listen to him if I'm not spending time with him if I'm not watching for those moments when he's trying to tell me something um, Jeremiah 10 23 says I know Lord that our lives are not our own we are not able to plan our own course I'm so glad that I am not planning my own course. The more I think about where I've come from and what he's pulled me out of and just how far I've come, um, I know we all have stories like that, what he's done for us. And the more I think about it, I realize I, I don't wanna go back there. I don't ever wanna go back there. There's nothing this world has to offer me that could ever compare to what we have in Jesus. And, um, Man, I can never go back. I just want more of him. And I realize that my life is no longer my own. I'm his, and I just want to be more like him. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ in me. I'm his. You're his. So let's stand and worship him together this morning. Worship him for who he is. We praise him for what he's done. And we surrender our life to him. And ask him to mold you and shape you. Don't let the distractions cause you to miss out on what he has for you this morning. Just fix your eyes on him. Let everything else go. And just sit in the presence of your savior and your king this morning. Amen. Lord, we just, we just give you this time this morning. Lord, we just want more of you. We want you to mold us and shape us into who you want us to be, Lord. We know that we can't do anything without you, Lord, but with you, all things are possible. And um, yeah, we just want to be more like you, Lord. We pray that you would just be glorified in this place this morning, that you would inhabit the praises of your people, you would just pour your spirit out on this place, Lord. Lord, just make us more like you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. You guys can have a seat. I have a couple quick announcements for us this morning. Are we happy to be in church this morning or what? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I am so glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. So uh, just some announcements to start off with here. First of all, this Thursday, we typically have a biblical uh, question and answer, and that's going to be canceled this Thursday. So if you have any uh, burning questions about the Bible or the, or the Christian faith on your heart, just save those for next month. Um, and instead of that, we're going to be having a Good Friday service this Friday to remember uh, our Lord and Savior's sacrifice that he gave for us on the cross. Amen. Amen. So that's going to be at 7 p.m. this Friday uh, here at the church. And there is going to be child care um, up to Starfish, I believe. Uh, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, excited for that. Excited to see you guys out here. And uh, also, Easter is next Sunday. <laughs> And uh, for that service, we're expecting and praying for uh, tons of people to come out. We're praying for a full sanctuary, full parking lot, uh, and just tons of people to come out and hear the gospel and uh, give their lives to Christ. Amen. Amen. With that, uh, we are expecting our prayers to be answered and expecting a lot of people to come out. And uh, with that, we're going to need some help. The... Um, we're going to need help ushering, having people here be able to find seats for people, welcoming people into the church. We're definitely going to need some help outside with parking and things, things of that nature. So uh, if you would like to serve the Lord in a practical manner, which I hope all of us do, uh, get, a hold and talk, uh, get a hold of James Nichols. He's our, uh, in charge of our deacons. James, you in here this morning? He's working hard somewhere outside or hunting. We're not sure which. Uh, talk to James Nichols, talk to Chris, talk to somebody with a name tag, uh, and I think, I don't know if we have a sign-up sheet, but I'm sure we will have an, uh, out in the foyer out here, uh, if you'd like to help. Thank you for that. And, uh, and then also, yeah, Resurrection Celebrations next Sunday, okay? I already kind of announced that, but um, it's in March this year, Amen. <laughs> Uh, our Sunday, Sunday service, obviously, is going to be at 10 a.m., and so there's also going to be brunch in the fellowship hall and baptisms directly after the service. So um, if you're someone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ but hasn't been baptized, it's actually the first command that Jesus gives someone is to believe and be baptized. We don't have to be baptized to be saved, but uh, it's a command that our Lord tells us to do, to declare our faith. So if you want to be baptized, or if you know someone that would want to be baptized, or if you know someone that needs to be saved and then baptized in the same day, come to church on Easter Sunday, amen? It's going to be great. And even if you have already been baptized, it's awesome to just go out and watch and hang out as other people are proclaiming their faith, getting saved. It's going to be an awesome day. So um, be praying for that day. Be praying how the Lord would uh, have you serve in some way, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to that. So as the kids come up, I do believe we have some kids in the house this morning. You guys can start making your way up here. Uh, I have a, uh, just a verse here from the book of Job that uh, um, just was brought to my attention at the men's conference we went to, but it says that Job was a blameless and upright man who feared God, he had uh, seven sons and three daughters. And it says in Job chapter 1 and verse 5 that Job would send and consecrate them. He would rise early in the morning and consecrate or sanctify his children. And down at the end of that, it says, thus Job did continually. So in some way, shape, or form, and it says here that he, he offered burnt offerings on behalf of his children, but he sanctified his children. He, and that word sanctified just means to set apart or to set aside for the purpose of the Lord. And I love that because Job actually, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's a buzzword these days, intentionally. 
He was intentional about sanctifying his children. He rose early in the morning, and thus he did continually. So what does that mean for us? Well, to sanctify our children, to set them aside for the work of the Lord, to pray for them, to raise them up in the discipline of the Lord, to teach the word of God to them, to demonstrate what it looks like to be a Christian to them, to sanctify our children continually. Amen? So I want everybody just to look up here at these children. I know we, we bring the children up every week, but just to look at them and join me in just sanctifying them in maybe just a, whatever small way we can this morning. Amen? So Lord, we do lift up these children to you. Some of them are our children or our grandchildren or our nieces and nephews. And Father, we know that they are the the future husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, future pastors, future evangelists, future missionaries. These souls that you have chosen to, Lord, to do your work, to follow you, to continue the Great Commission as long as you tarry. And Lord, we just want to pray for them this morning. I don't, I don't even know exactly what that means, what to do even in this moment, but Lord, just as Job sanctified his children, we would like to sanctify this group of children here at our church this morning. And as they go back to their classes, that the word of God would become real to them, that you would touch their hearts with your Holy Spirit, and that they would know you in a real way, Lord, that they would experience you. And even as we pray for them this morning, I just think of where it says, Job continually, thus Job did continually. May we be parents and friends and grandparents that continually would remember to sanctify, consecrate, pray for, demonstrate for the children in our lives. And we just give them to you and trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so right, and we're going to continue worshiping the Lord. And uh, I just praise God for all these talented musicians up here to, uh, that, uh, you know, they want to, they just have a heart to serve the Lord and to bless him, but to also lead us in worship. Amen. And, uh, but in the, in the, excuse me, in the middle of our worship, we also want to remember to worship God with our finances. And uh, if you'd like to give to the work here at Coastline, um, financially, we have boxes in the back where you can uh, drop cash check or money order or um, give online on Tithely, whatever the, whatever the Lord is leading you to do. Let's pray for that. And Lord, um, this morning also we want to just worship you in spirit and truth, but also worship you with the finances you've given to us. And Lord, what a blessing it is when we give to, the, to your work, Lord, here at the local church. And as we give, even as the local church gives to missionaries and um, things all around the world for the gospel to go forth, what a blessing it is to... Um, for just a little part of my life and a little part of the income you've given me to have real purpose, to have real eternal, everlasting purpose, to know that even if it's just, you know, a little bit of the money you've given me to go out, Lord, it gives me a, a reason to keep working, Lord, to keep, um, just gives me purpose. And Lord, that's, that's what you want to give every one of us not just with the money of our lives, but with everything in our life. But it is including our money, Lord. And so thank you for that purpose you've given us. Thank you for the gift that you've given us. And Lord, we just want to ask that you would bless the gift given this morning and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen.
part that says, lift up your shout. Lift up a shout of praise to him. Let's just do that this morning. Lift up your shouts of praise to the Lord. Lord, we just thank you so much. Lord, that you were not willing to just leave us here, Lord, but that you had a plan from the beginning and you came and you saved us, Lord.
says, Lord, that you inhabit the praises of your people. There's something special when we worship you, when we declare praises and thanks to you, Lord, where we sense your tangible presence. We know, Lord, that through our faith in Jesus, your, your spirit's inside of us, that you're always with us but we fail to recognize that a lot of the time because we're distracted by the things going on around us. So it's, it's good for us to, to pray. It's good for us to be in your word. It's, it's good for us to worship because it helps get our mind back where we want it always to be, and that's on you. We know that there's a day coming, just as we were singing, Lord, that really just hit me that this is a song that's never gonna end because there's a day coming where we'll be in your presence. And as your word says, we'll never leave it again, and we'll be worshiping you night and day, just like we see throughout your word that the host of heaven is doing at this moment. We're joining in with this song that's never gonna end for all eternity and how great of a day that's going to be. But we're thankful now that we can praise you and, and, and recognize your presence is here with us. And because of that, we're excited, Lord. We come here anticipating to meet with our Father in heaven. We come here anticipating to hear you speak to us through your word. And so may our focus be completely on you. May we give you our undivided attention so we hear the voice of God, just even as we talked about last week. We're not here just to to get a Bible study and and fill our heads with knowledge. We're here to hear you speak your your living word into our lives so that we can apply it and experience the things you have for us. Experience you, Lord. So speak to us in this place today. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Hey, turn to the person next to you Remind them that God loves them and then introduce yourself and we'll get going here shortly. All right, well, as you guys find your seats, if you need a Bible, raise your hands. We'll have some of our deacons passing those out. Those can be a a gift for you guys from the Lord. We want you to have that. If you don't own one, keep it. And we will get to our verse-by-verse study through Romans. But first, we've got another special guest today, like we did last week. Um, Some of you guys know, over the last couple years, uh, we've sent our uh, high schoolers to um, a, like a short-term mission trip to serve at Camp Attitude, which is a, a ministry focused on um, ministering to families and, and their kids that have disabilities in the name of Jesus. So an awesome, awesome ministry, and there's been so much fruit from that. And so we invited um, one of the people, one of the leaders there, Stacy, to come and share about it because the high schoolers are going again this year, and there's also opportunities for some adults to serve if you want. So I'm gonna have Stacy come up here, and she's gonna share about it with you guys. Go ahead and welcome her. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me here, and uh, what an honor and a blessing it is to worship alongside you guys today. I knew uh, when that first song started playing that uh, this church would be home for me too. I felt comfortable here because the mission is the same. Um, at- attitude as it here as as it is here in this church so thank you for your uh, kind welcome and um, I'm excited to share about camp attitude um, which is a ministry very very close to my heart I think we have a video queued up uh, it does a much better job kind of explaining uh, and helps you to see
my name is Dan Whitney, and I'm president of Camp Attitude, Oregon. At the end of 2000, uh, I broke my neck. When I did that, I was paralyzed from the neck down. While I was in the hospital, I had no idea what was going to come. I didn't know if I'd ever move below my neck again. It was just a whole new normal. And my kids knew it was, you know, dad was going to be different from now on. And uh, my wife just supported me the whole way. During that time, uh, I met a guy that had the idea for this camp up here. And at that point, I really needed to be a part of something because I knew it was going to be special. In 2005, we had one week. 2006, we had three weeks. And then from there on, it's been eight weeks. And then we have specialized camps. Now it would be like osteo imperfecta, which is brittle bone disease. And in the future, we hope to have even more specialized camps like autism. You have the special needs child, and they are the rock stars. They're so used to being told no, no, no in so many parts of society and them being a burden. We totally redefine normal. In the outside world, if they have a physical disability, children are looked at differently, they're pointed at, they're not included, they're told no that they can't participate. And on this side of the wall, kids are accepted and loved for who they are, no matter what their ability is. It really is an amazing transformation to watch these people because they're expecting like the other shoe to drop for there to be some type of fee or something that goes with it. There's no cost. Everything that we do is based off of donations. We have the buddies, and the buddies are with their camper, uh, their special needs child, from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. And the amazing thing about that is the relationship that is built between those two. I love coming back to Camp Attitude because I love seeing the smiles on these kids' faces, and I love seeing them be able to have fun without any judgment from anyone. Every year I learn something new and it every week teaches me how to care for others and to be compassionate and to, un like, to take time to understand the struggles that other people go through. It's so incredible getting to meet the campers and their families and you make wonderful connections with people that last for a lifetime. The parents come up and they actually get a respite and they don't get that. That respite time is so critical. As special needs parents, um, we're on <laughs> all the time, 24-7. Um, we live in a state of heightened <laughs> attention. And to be able to come here and know that our kid is safe and happy and accepted has been truly amazing for us. By far, my favorite thing is the talent show. These kids get up there and they do things they've never done and the parents cannot believe what they're seeing. I mean, it's like standing ovation for them. Here's God taking special needs children and the love from this camp and that's the buddies and everybody else that has just shown them love all week and they feel like, hey, you know what, I can do this. God is at the center of everything that we do. People that attend don't have to be Christians. We make it known that we're a faith-based camp, but we're not here to proselytize to them. We want to do that through our actions, which is our Philippians 2.5, that we should, we should have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And so that's what we tell everybody. Don't go out there and tell people, show people. That's where God is saying, hey, I'm gonna plant some seeds through you people. The ultimate goal is we're going to have some people walk out of here and feel like, hey, this 
is what Christians do. And this is what, more importantly, what Christ can do. And so we're not about religion, we're about relationship. And that's what's emphasized all week long. I'm very thankful for the foundation of faith that I received here at camp. There was not one person that judged my struggle. They accepted my brokenness. We are so happy, so at peace, just working with campers and with Camp Attitude, and we never would have imagined that our life would go that way before Dan's accident. God always has great plans. When I broke my neck, I never asked the question why. It was what. You know, what does God want me to do now? This is what God has given me. He's given me joy in my heart, and um, there's not many days where I lose that. If you're going to pray, God, use me, be ready for the way he's going to use you because I never dreamt that he would use a broken neck to accomplish something that he wanted to accomplish. But I'm so glad that he did it. And I'm here today to say, I'm glad that I broke my neck. I'm glad that I'm, that I'm partially paralyzed. I'm thankful for that because of what has come from it. My little slice of heaven. Uh, we're located right outside of Sweet Home, Oregon. Uh, if you know Foster Lake, we are a mile or two um, kind of above that, right along the Sanium River. Uh, beautiful property to honor the Lord. And uh, uh, I'm the executive director out at Camp Attitude. This is my, this will be my third summer up there directing. But I have, uh, camp has been a part of my life since I was actually in junior high, uh, all the way in the 1900s. I, when I was <laughs> in junior high, uh, uh, the, the man that Dan met who had the idea for the camp was my father. And so um, uh, he was in youth ministry at that time. And so in junior high and all through high school, I spent um, most summers and many weekends um, up at Camp Attitude uh, praying over the property and uh, dreaming about what God was going to do up there. I uh, never uh, in my wildest dreams thought that he would use me in uh, the director position, but I'm so honored to uh, be able to be uh, there and serving Camp Attitude full time now. Um, and yeah, so, uh, you know, camp started, we, we had our first camp um, actually in 2000, and I was in high school at the time, and I got to be a buddy uh, to two uh, siblings. Um, and at that time, we, we only knew that we wanted the camp to be accessible. And I say we, I, I had no decision making whatsoever at this point, but my dad and, and Dan and um, kind of the men that uh, worked so hard and prayed so hard for this camp. Uh, so we did one week of family camp um, and uh, that, that week changed our lives and changed our perspective on the community of disability and and how we uh, treat people or look at people who have disabilities and um, it continues to do that to this day um, I can tell you that I've seen so many lives changed not just in our camper families which that is the main goal is to love those families so well and um, and have them ask you know we're, we're a Christian camp but our camper families are not required um, to be Christians at all. We kind of warn them, we give them a heads up because we do like worship and we, uh, we do have um, you know, a lot of those aspects of a Christian camp, but, um, but families come to us exhausted. Um, some are broken, some are just in need of encouragement and um, and we're able to offer that to them. All of our volunteers, we do ask that they be believers, that they have a relationship with Jesus. And that way, when our camper families ask, the parents often do, uh, when they ask what makes 
this so different? What makes these people so different that they would give a week or a month of their time to serve us? And then we can say, that's Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes that difference. Um, and our whole goal is to love as Jesus loves us, um, to have the attitude of Christ Jesus, as they said in the video. And that's where the name comes from, uh, contrary to popular assumption that we um, are up there to adjust an attitude, which does happen often, but uh, it's more about having that mindset um, to love as Jesus loved us. So um, there are many ways that you can serve if the Lord is tugging on your heart today or if he does in the coming months. Um, uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we do offer um, all of our family camps. We do seven weeks in the summer, um, serve about 20 families per week, and those families all come for free. So we do not want to add to their burdens. Many families in the community of disability have added costs already, um, whether it be surgeries or therapy or doctor visits, whatever it is. So we don't want to add to that cost. So we um, offer the camp free of charge. It's just another way that we make uh, Camp Attitude accessible to everyone. Um, but that means that we need support. So um, there's uh, that is one tangible way is to support us in that way. But we'd also love to to see your faces uh, up at Camp Attitude this summer. Um, uh, you can serve for a week. We have kind of two opportunities there, and you guys have already um, heard that call and have been sending your high school students, and that has been a wonderful gift to us. We need um, a lot of volunteers to make um, Camp Attitude uh, go for the whole summer. So, um, you know, high school students, if the Lord is tugging on your heart, we'd love to see you this summer. It is um, a life-changing and a very special week, uh, and we are there to support you as you build those relationships. And uh, families and individuals, you can also come up. So if you've got younger kids and you just want to start demonstrating what it means to serve Jesus, uh, there's a place for you on our servant team as well. So um, it's a, a neat opportunity. Our servant team does they're the behind the scenes, so they help in the kitchen, they clean tables, clean bathrooms. Um, but such a huge part of the ministry in helping us keep Camp Attitude free for our families. And you also have that opportunity to sit with these families at, at mealtimes and uh, get to know their stories, and they get to know you, and you get to show the love of Christ to them. So um, I have uh, a million stories I can share, but I'll just hang out in the back uh, at the table uh, back there. If anyone is interested to know more about Camp Attitude, I uh, would love to share. So thank you guys again so much for having me out to worship with you today. Appreciate it. Let me go ahead and pray for you before uh, you guys sit down. Will you guys join me as we pray for this ministry and for Stacy? Lord God, just thank you so much for my sister and her willingness to come up here and share this with us. I just found myself really moved in watching that video, Lord, and just I, I think there's something that resonates in us um, as believers when we see the work of Jesus being done, and Lord, that's the work of Jesus being done. And Father, we just pray that you'd continue to allow it to be, um, that you provide for them, that you'd bring them the families that need help, that need encouragement, that need to know you. First and foremost, the, the kids that need to know you and need to experience your love firsthand, Lord. That, that's what's changed all of us. And um, we know that sometimes you even allow um, hard things in lives, such as disabilities, um, and you use them for our good. You use them to reveal yourself to us. You, you use them to show us your love um, because we search for it. And so I just pray that this ministry would continue to be fruitful, Lord. And if there's ways that you want us to come alongside, whether it's going or sending or supporting or praying, all, whatever it is, Lord, just... Bring those things to our mind even now and, and, and may they not just be things we forget but that we pursue, Lord, and follow as you lead us into those things as you want us to be a part of it. And bless my sister, Lord. Just give her uh, the wisdom and the ability to know your will for this camp and lead as you lead her, Father, in it and all the other people serving there. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you.
So as Stacy said, she'll be back there right out the foyer doors uh, after service. So you guys are welcome. If you have questions or you want to get some information to bring home, she'll give you that. So, all right. Well, go ahead and open to Romans chapter 12. If you guys were here last week, oh, we continued our verse-by-verse verse study. We didn't get very far, only the first two verses in chapter 12. And... Um, we talked about the importance of surrendering our lives to God so basically we, we can know what his will is and we can be led by him into it. Um, and the reason we wanna do that, our motivation is that, as Paul says there in Romans 12 too, his will is always gonna be good, it's gonna be pleasing, and it's gonna be perfect. Those are all things we want in our lives, right? Every choice we make is trying to make our lives good. It's trying to bring things that are pleasing perfection, if you will, and so those things are found in God's will. Really, they're only found in God's will. And this week, we're gonna see Paul start to talk about exactly what the will of God is for you in your life. So let me read the section, and then I'll pray, and then we'll start going through it, um, breaking it down verse by verse. So Romans chapter, start, chapter 12, starting in verse three, going through verse eight. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Lord God, again, Father, this being such a, we know all scripture's good, it's all necessary, even as we talked about last week, but this is one of those ones, Lord, where it helps us understand our role in the body of Christ and how it's a significant one. How if we're somehow missing, the rest of the body hurts. How we're not only wanted by you, but we're needed by you and by each other. And so Father, these are things that we want to really be ingrained in us so we can look at who we are in you and and understand our role in your kingdom the right way so we can live those truths out in our life. So speak to us even now, in Jesus' name, amen. So again, this, in this passage today, Paul's encouraging us to, to follow the will of God in our life. Specifically, what he's talking about are the gifts God gives each of us that he wants to operate in. He wants us to live those gifts out in our life. That is an absolute will. We talk about The absolute will of God, anything God says in his word, those are things we can know. We don't ever have to doubt what his word says. Ephesians 2.10 tells us, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You're not an accident, all right? God saved you, and as we saw earlier in Romans, he predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son, to be made like Jesus. And part of that is that God has these works before you, even before, as he says, prepared in advance for you to do. He's prepared these good things for you to do and gifted you uniquely to do those things. And so that's what we're gonna see in this section today. And if you're an outliner, I'm gonna kind of break down the three points we're gonna cover. In verse three, he's gonna tell us first how not to view the gifts God has given us, or how to, how it's incorrectly, how to view yourself in light of the gifts God's given you. And then in verses four through five, he's going to teach us, second, the correct way to view the gifts God has given us, or how to correctly view yourself in light of the gifts God has given you. And then thirdly, in verses six through eight, he's gonna exhort us to make sure we are utilizing the gifts God has given us. Make sure that you are using the gifts God has given you in this life. So let's first look at this warning by Paul regarding the wrong way to view our giftings from the Lord. 
He says, starting in verse three, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, or the idea is to honestly evaluate yourself, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned, or the idea is given to us. So in this passage of scripture where Paul's in encouraging us to use the giftings that God has given each of us or to live out God's will in our lives, first and foremost, what he warns us is to stay humble. And there's a reason for that because every single human in this earth is prone to pride, okay? Every single one of us, pride often being the reason that people don't turn to God in the first place or we don't think we need him. It being the reason of so many things that God has to overcome in us to actually be able to teach us things. And even when it comes to the way God wants to use us to do great things, we are susceptible to pride and somehow falling into the trap of thinking that it's us doing it or we're something special. But if we honestly evaluate ourselves, as Paul says in verse three, we understand that if there's anything good in me, if there's anything good I can do in this life, it most certainly isn't because of me, all right? Because I, as we saw in the first 11 chapters of Romans, as Paul explained to us, was a wretch. I was lost. I was, my heart is deceitful. I can't even trust it. I was born wicked. I was not born good. And I needed to be saved from all of that, okay? If there's anything good in us, Anything good we're able to do, it is by God's grace and his alone. Even in verse three, I like how he points out, even your faith is a gift from God. You can't even take credit for that. The things you seem to be good at in this life, the way God is using you to bless others are all because of how God has made you and his Holy Spirit enabling you to do those things. So therefore... There's truly no reason for any of us Christians as a part of God's church to think of ourselves as better or more important than anyone else. Amen? That would be an improper way to view yourself in light of the will of God for your life and the giftings he's given you. And that's what he wants you to understand first because before he even gets into the giftings God's given you, he's like, have the right mindset. Be humble, and the reason that's important because if you're not humble, then you will not be relying on God, and then you become unusable by God. We wanna stay in that place of humility. The more we realize we need help, the more God can help us and do everything he wants to do in and through us in our lives. Now he's gonna go on to tell us the correct way to view, because it's not all just like, okay, I wanna stay humble, but I just, I'm just crap, and I'm just gonna, no, that's not what he's saying, all right? Actually, quite the contrary, you're very important. So he goes on to say in verse four, for as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. So now he compares his church, God compare, or Paul's comparing God's church to your human body, okay, in verses four through five. Just like your single body is composed of many body parts, so is God's church a single entity made up of many distinct members that are unified by his Holy Spirit that dwells in us. There being unity in God's church, but most certainly not uniformity, okay? Because we are all very diverse people, some of you guys can just look right next to you and you're like, amen. <laughs> all diverse for a variety of reasons, yet all wanting to follow Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior. So we're diverse people, but we all have a single focus. That's what unifies us, right? A single most important purpose, and that is to summed up, follow Jesus, first and foremost, in our lives. And this is important for us to understand because when we get this, this will allow individual, individuality to exist in God's church while maintaining unity at the same time, all right? 
And not just here in all your relationships, your marriage, all right? That's a big one. Because there was a time in my life where my, I thought my job as a husband was to conform my wife to my image. Or I wanted her to be the way I wanted her to be. And that caused a lot of confliction in our marriage. A lot of conflict. But God taught me one day, I just remember it here in Clara's day, do you want her to be who you want her to be or who I want her to be? And that was really convicting for me because the answer was obvious. It's like, well, I don't want her to be conformed to my image. I want her to be conformed to your image. And then I started seeing her indiv individuality or the differences, the, the things that were different than me. That were, and we're not talking about sin issues. We're talking about she's just a different person and how those things were actually beneficial because they made up for where I lacked. And that's how we are in the church too. That's how we're to look at each other. Paul also telling us here in verses four through five, three things that you need to know as a believer. These are, these are things that we're searching for in life. And he says you have these as a believer. The first is that you're unique. You're special. The second thing is that you have been made for a significant purpose. You're not by accident or you're not just kind of insignificant. You have perfect purpose. You're part of God's plan, and he's made you unique to be able to fulfill that plan. And then the third thing is that you're indispensable. Nobody is better without you. We are all worse off without you. Paul elaborates on this in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. Bear with me, it's a big section, but I'm gonna read it because he talks about what he said here in two verses in a lot more detail. He says, 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 12, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ, or it's just, it's the same with God's church. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. We're, we're very diverse, we're different people, but we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that doesn't make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? I like how he's pointed out because in our terms, how we do that is we look at other people and we say, oh yeah, God's using them but he's not using me like that, so I'm not important. They can do without me. And he's saying, that's foolish. I mean, would, would, would your body do well without its foot? Would your body do well without its elbow? No, if you lost a part of your body, the whole rest of it would be inhibited from functioning correctly. And he's saying, that's how it is with you as a part of God's church. If you aren't here doing the unique things God's created you to do, then the rest of the body suffers. It can't be without you. It says, goes on, if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony or unity among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together, all of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Love that. Every single one of you is important. Every single one of you is indispensable. Just as all of your body parts have an important function, despite being quite different in most circumstances, and 
Should one be removed would cause negative repercussions to the rest of your body, or should one be hurt would result in the rest of the body feeling pain? All those truths apply to you as a member, as a family member of God's church. There can be many tools, if you will, in the carpenter's arsenal, but any of you guys that do construction, been here probably knows this, you'd be hard pressed to pick any one tool more important than the other because they all have specific functions and they're all needed to accomplish different tasks. And when they're put in the hand of a master craftsman who knows how and to, when to use each one, he can basically create objects of beauty. And it's the same with the master of this universe that created you with specific functions or gifts that are needed to accomplish certain tasks of his so that his beautiful plan can come into his exist existence. And this is important for us to understand for a couple reasons, because here's the thing. When the enemy tries to get you to believe that lie, and I'm sure you've heard it because I've heard it before many times, that you have no purpose, that somehow you don't belong here, somehow nobody would miss me if I'm gone, you need to rebuke it with the truth that I'm sharing with you today from God's very lips, because you are unique you are indispensable, then you have a significant purpose and we don't only want you here, but we need you here. We suffer without you. And this is the proper way. When, so a lot of the times like we can look at like um, doing life as a Christian, wh whether that's like gathering with other believers, like, throughout the week or going to church on Sunday, we, we kind of look at it as this box we have to check. And, and okay, I'm being a good Christian if I go to church or I go to this bi midweek Bible study and I'm a bad Christian if I don't. Or, and, and that's not how God views it all. That's not the way you view it. In light of what Paul's telling us, the way you view it is like, if I don't go, everyone else is gonna miss out. They're gonna suffer. If I don't go, I'm gonna miss out. I'm gonna suffer. That's the way he wants you to view it. And this is also important for us to understand, listen to me here on this, because when, not if, when that other brother and sister you run into that for whatever reason feels like sandpaper sometimes, listen, just being honest, because we know this happens, okay? And I'm gonna say right off the bat, it's probably not for any other reason other than they're different. And as I've said before, you guys have been here long enough, different is not bad. We have to remember that. Okay, different is not bad. Again, I'm not talking about sin issues, but just because somebody is different, which we all are, does not automatically make the things they do that you can't stand bad. It just makes them different. Man, your marriage will be so much better if you learn that, right? I'm telling you. All right, but all that to say is when you run into those people and you understand this truth that they're needed to bless you, there's something God's gifted them to do that no one else can that's going to bring fruit in your life, that they're indispensable, that you need them, that is what will help you show love and grace, even if they bother you, because you understand you need them, and they need you, and we'd miss out without them. So now that Paul's helped us have this better understanding, this is the wrong way to view your giftings. This is the right way. Now he's actually gonna get into these gifts and, and basically making sure, like exhorting us. You, you guys, these are your gifts, use them, okay? He says in verse six, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving the one who teaches, in his teaching the one who exhorts, in his exhortation, the one who contributes or gives. In generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy or shows kindness to others with cheerfulness or does it gladly. So Paul tells us here that God has given each of us specific abilities to do things well. And I want you to note what they're referred to as in verse six. What? A gift, all right? Now this is important, all right? Because a gift you give to somebody to bless them, right? Now, we all probably think to some degree, because the Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, we'll read it in a second, tells us that our gifts are meant to bless others. But here's the thing, they're meant to bless you. 
When you utilize these gifts, you're meant to be blessed because there's a fulfillment, there's a satisfaction that you, we're all looking for in life that you're only gonna find in doing what God made you to do. And that's important for us to understand because when we think of it as just serving others, we can get burnt out, we can get tired and we're thinking of it the wrong way. And so I have to remind myself often that, hey, if God tells me to do something, first and foremost, that's to bless me. That's what his word says. Jesus told us that in Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, blessing or happiness will come to your life when you hear and obey the word of God. So as we learned last week in Romans 12, 2, all God's will for you, which he's telling you to operate in, these gifts, you live these out in your life, is good, pleasing, and perfect. And that's really all the motivation we should ever need for wanting to do these things, wanting to serve the Lord, wanting to operate in our giftings because this is where we're gonna experience our lives to be good, pleasing, and perfect. This is where we're gonna be blessed. This is where we're gonna be satisfied and fulfilled. All things we're looking for constantly in our life. Paul also telling us in verse six that these gifts are given to us by God's grace or completely based off of God's choosing rather than being based on merit or us earning or deserving them somehow, which is important to understand too, because here's the thing, you're not working your way up some career ladder in God's kingdom. There is no ladder to work yourself up. You see, since we've all been made as right as we could ever be in God's eyes through our faith in Jesus, what we're remembering this Easter week, we can't outperform each other, and as such, nobody's more deserving of any gift than the other. And each of our roles are equally important. God has this perfect plan in place and each of us have a significant role in it as Paul's already pointed out. And as part of that plan, God gives each of us by his grace giftings that his will is for us to live out in our lives because he knows that it's, it's where we'll be best off. Will will experience goodness and pleasingness and happiness. Paul elaborates on this in 1 Corinthians 12, four through 11. He says, there are many different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. He goes on to say in verse 11, it is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So remember, God's never unfair in his distribution of gifts because they're by his grace. And grace, by definition, is giving us what we don't deserve. And as Paul pointed out at the beginning, understanding that the things we are gifted in are solely by God's grace should not only keep us from becoming prideful in the things that we're good at, we're doing for the Lord, but it should also keep us from exalting other men or women because of their giftings. The reality being, if you wanna give somebody praise, give it to God because he's the reason the way they are. And when people come up and tell me, good job, or give me praise about something I do, I often try to do this really quickly. Now, I understand they're just acknowledging that God worked through me or did something, and, and I appreciate that acknowledgement. I really do. I, I'm encouraged. It encourages me. But I also try to redirect it really quickly and say, praise the Lord. Because again, for the reasons I shared at the very beginning, I'm just susceptible to falling under the illusion that somehow I'm great or somehow I'm I'm doing things, it's because of me. And if it, I get to that point, that's when I start to become unusable by the Lord and I do not wanna ever be in that place, amen? So let's talk about some of these specific gifts really quick here. The first being the gift of prophecy or to speak forth the word of God. Now, though we do see prophecy in the Bible that speaks of future events, it's one of the reasons we know the Bible's true because there's a lot of prophecy that has been fulfilled, only God could produce. It would be wrong to associate this gift only with foretelling or predicting the future because primarily what you see prophecy used, at, used for in the Bible is forth 
telling or declaring the heart and mind of God, which may or may not include predictions, but will always line up with what God's word says. You're never, if anyone's ever telling you something like thus says the Lord and it's opposite of what God's word says, it ain't from him, all right? That's an absolute. And those that have this gift, they typically operated it by sensing that God wants them to share something with somebody, maybe with an individual, maybe in a bigger setting like this with multiple people, but there's a specific word or scripture on their heart or something specific about somebody's life that they just, it's like burning inside of them. They have to share it. And I honestly, if I'm being honest with you, Every single week I come up here, I pray for the gift of prophecy for the reasons I shared last week. I don't wanna just give you guys a Bible study. I want you guys to know the word of God, don't get me wrong, but I want the very word of God. I want him to speak to you through his word to something going on in your life that I could never do because I can't read your mind. I don't know everything going on in your life. And when somebody, when people come up to me afterwards, which happens on occasion, and they say, how do you know what's going on in my life? It's like you were speaking right to the situation. For me, I'm like, praise the Lord, because that was the Holy Spirit, and God cares about you, and he was speaking to you. And that's just proof that God was using me as a vessel to speak through his word prophetically into your life. And verse six says we should only use this gift in proportion to our faith, which doesn't mean it won't take faith to proclaim the word of God when he puts it on your heart because I still struggle with that sometimes. Do I say it? Do I not say it? I think the Lord wants me to say it. But what it means is that you, you shouldn't speak on behalf of God unless you absolutely know that he's told you to say something. And again, that's always gonna line up with his word. It's never gonna disagree with it. And that's something I try to be careful of too because we can have this habit of tagging well, the Lord told me to do this, or, or I, I, I think the Lord's telling me to tell you to do this because we wanna give power to what we're saying. Don't do that unless it's actually the Lord. Next, Paul talks about the gift of service or ministry. Now, this is one of those gifts where we're all called to serve, right? We understand that. As Christians, Jesus set this example of washing feet and said, do as I do. Like, this is our call, all right? But some people have a supernatural gift where they just are prone to serve. You don't have to ask them to do anything. They're already, they see a need and they're already on it and they do it. Whereas prophecy declares the truth of God's word, ministry or serving others depicts the truth of God's word. And the perfect model for this gift and every gift we're talking about today is Jesus because he did this perfectly, right? He not only taught people truth, but he touched them as an illustration of what he taught by serving them. And so that's the model that we wanna follow. Paul also talks about the gift of teaching or explaining the meaning of God's word to people. Whereas a prophet might share the word of God more sporadically, somebody that teaches God's word or has a gift of teaching shares it systematically and it, he basically they help people understand what God's word means. Next, Paul talks about the gift of exhortation or encouraging people to practice what they've been taught in God's word, both the teaching of God's word and the exhortation of it being necessary for you to be spiritually mature in your life. As if we're just constantly taking in God's word and we're never being exhorted by anyone to live it out in our lives, you just become a fat sheep that's useless, okay? Not useless, but close to it. Or if you're somebody that's never being taught the word of God, never in the word of God digesting it, and you're just being told to follow Jesus all the time, you'll have those emotional moments where you're like, yeah, I'm on fire, I'm gonna go out and live for Jesus, but you'll burn out. Or you just quite frankly won't know how to serve him right because you've never been taught to. We all need those people in our lives, those brothers and sisters, that will tell you what you need to hear, and I'm gonna tell you right now, God will use people in your life if you're willing to surround yourself with people that'll tell you what you need to hear instead of what you wanna hear, all right? But we all know those people, we all need those people that'll give us that kick in the butt and say, this is what God's word says, you need to do this in your life, amen? Amen. Next, Paul talks about the gift of contribution or giving. Again, this is something that Jesus says is good for all of us to do as Christians, but some people, are gifted and they're just very generous. That's what he says. He says they do it 
generously. The gift of giving is what God uses to expand his work. He uses that person as a gift or with this gift as a channel for him to provide the needs of people around them. And as they are generous with that gift, God is generous to them. It's like a cycle. He gives, they give, he gives more, they give. Next, Paul talks about the gift to lead or those that have been given the ability to oversee and govern others. These are the people that you know in your life that maybe you that know how to get things done. You know how to coordinate and plan to do things efficiently and effectively. You know, these are people that are easy to follow because you can see, well, this person knows what they're doing. I'm gonna listen to them. I'm gonna follow them. And for those that have that gift, they must do it with zeal. Or the idea is diligence, as Paul says in verse seven, because quite frankly, whenever you're in a leadership position, I don't care if it's in the church or out there in the real world, I've been in both, it's hard. And there's difficulty. And you wanna quit a lot of the time, or sometimes. But here's the thing, if God's called you to it, He's gonna give you the grace to endure and persevere. So you have to be diligent. You have to keep going. You have to keep relying on God, knowing that the difficulty's gonna come, but he's gonna get you through it. Amen? And then the next one he talks about is mercy or showing kindness to, towards others. Now, again, this is something we all do as Christians. We, we're kind as God's been kind to us, but some people have this gift and they, you can really see it when they're showing that kindness to people that on the outside don't look like they deserve it. And they're just naturally able to do it. And here's the thing that's really convicting to me when I read this is they say, he says to do it with cheerfulness or gladly. Because here's the thing, I can fake it to make it easy. I can be kind to people and intentionally do kind things because I know that's what God tells me to do. But if I'm being honest, sometimes I don't have a glad attitude about it. I don't have a cheerful attitude, but that's what I want because that's what God, God is glad. He doesn't begrudgingly show his kindness to you or his mercy to you, he does it gladly. And that's how he wants us to be with his help. And some people have that natural gift where they're that way. Now, I think that was the last one, it was, okay. So I just briefly touched on those gifts and again, you can look up more if you wanna know more about them, you can come up and ask questions. But the best thing you can do, read the gospels and what you'll see is Jesus demonstrates every one of these gifts perfectly and he is the example that you guys and me want to follow amen and here's the thing you might have one of these gifts even as i'm reading this you might say well there's multiple things that i can kind of see that these things in my life it's up to god some people have multiple some have single they come at different points in the life sometimes it's all up to god but if you're wondering how to tell what your giftings are the way they often manifest themselves is that you're just naturally prone to them okay sometimes it's even unrecognizable in you, but the people around you are the ones that see it. Because you're just like, I'm just being me. This is how I've always been. And people are like, no, this is a gifting because I'm not that way. Here's an example. If somebody was walking down the aisle right now to bring up communion elements, you guys have been here for a while, have heard me use this before. I think Pastor Jason used it before me. So I got it from him because as soon as it's public, it's everyone's can use it. All that to say, if somebody's walking up and they're bringing the communion elements and they trip and they fall, depending on what your natural gifting is, a lot of us are gonna react differently. For the person that's gifted in service, you're not gonna need to be asked to get up and clean it up, you're just gonna get up, where's the rag? I'll clean it up, all right? If you're gifted in contribution or giving, you might be somebody says, oh, it looks like that was broke or that was damaged, you know, I'll just put some extra money in the tithe box to cover that. If you're the one that's gifted to lead, you might say like, all right, I'm gonna go talk to Pastor Chris and I'm gonna tell him there's a better way to do this, a safer way so that doesn't happen again. If you're somebody with the, the gift of mercy, you're gonna go straight up and forget all the other stuff, you're gonna make sure that person's all right. So if you look at your life and the way you naturally respond to situations, you can often see what you're gifted in because God has made you that way supernaturally able to do things that he wants you to do to fulfill his will in your life, amen? So, if the spiritual gifts that God has given us, as I just said, are natural tendencies, or things that we're already prone to doing, why do you think Paul has to exhort us or to tell us to use them here in verses five through eight? Any guesses, questions, any? Well, yeah, okay. 
That was good. I have, a, I have some points why, but here's, the, here's one thing I want to point out first. There's a difference between just being gifted and intentionally recognizing and utilizing the gifts God's given you the way he wants you to, okay? That the, one doesn't automatically come with the other. And what I've experienced in my own life following Jesus and what I've seen with other Christians is for a variety of reasons, we can be reluctant sometimes to operate in or utilize our giftings for God the way he wants us to, or to follow his will for us when he's asking us to. One of the reasons, it can be scary to us, okay? A, a good example about this, and this surprises people that haven't known me for a long time, but people that know me know this. I hate public speaking. There is nothing about this that I enjoy. I've never, ever liked it, yet God, in his grace, in his all-knowing, has always put me in situations where I'm public speaking. I can remember doing it all through college, when I was working with ODOT, I was teaching classes, other people, other construction like workers, how to inspect jobs like several times a year. I've always been in this position, even though I, never, I don't like it. So like when there's, what I, I just say to that is like, if the Lord's asking you to do something and you're like, well, I don't like that, who cares? <laughs> that's not a disqualifying reason to do it. And that's not, and here's the thing, what you have to understand, why you need humility. God knows better than you do. And it's in teaching that he's taught me some of the greatest lessons that I wouldn't have learned any other way. One of them was the reason that I really hated it was because I was so afraid of what you guys thought of me. And that is such a debilitating and discouraging thing that God wants to save us from in life in general, all of us, right? Because we so focus on what other people think about us and if they don't like us or they're not happy with us or we're not fitting in and it causes so, you young people, causes, it causes so much strife in my life when I was younger. And it wasn't until I was teaching and I remember being in the middle of the teaching. I remember every Sunday getting up here for the first year I was a pastor and hating it and thinking, God, why did you do this to me? I mean, I'm gonna be faithful and I'm gonna do it, but I'm not enjoying any of it. And he's like, is your heart to glorify me? And I'm like, well, yeah, of course. That's why I'm doing this. Well, then why do you care what other people think? Sure seems like you care about glorifying yourself. And that was a hard lesson. And I was like, whoa, that, that actually makes sense. And God was helping me just understand what's most important is what he thinks of me, what he wants. I mean, of course, we, we don't wanna like, you know, like we wanna be above reproach. We wanna do act in a sinful way or whatnot. That's what I'm talking about. But like we worry, we have this fear of man. And God's like, you don't have to fear man. Just fear me. You know how I feel about you. All your confidence can be in what I say about you and what I want you to do, and you can be free of all that worry. And as soon as I learned that lesson, all of a sudden this became fun. And so, again, God knows better than us. And if we are willing to surrender, if we're willing to be humble, if we're willing to trust him and do it, even if it doesn't make sense, he will teach you stuff that will be valuable to every aspect of your life. Amen? So it could be scary to us. We could be selfish, if I'm being honest. More times than not, I don't say it's God's time. Oh, I just wanna do whatever you want, God, with your time. I call it my time, all right? And I can fill my life with a bunch of things that are my will instead of God's will. I love how Elizabeth Elliot said it back the best. The only thing that can prevent you from doing the will of God in your life is your will. And that's what gets in the way. That's where surrender. That's why Paul started this whole chapter with surrender because I gotta be in that surrendered place before I can even approach God the right way where he can lead me into his will. But that can be a reason why I'm not using the gifts God's given me because I'm selfish. Another reason, unrealistic expectations. I can put all this pressure on myself on what, again, looking at other people, thinking, well, I can't do this. I'm not like that person or like even like misunderstanding what the gift is, like teaching what I'm doing right now. It's just to help you understand what God's word means. It doesn't say I'm responsible for your salvation. It doesn't, responsible, it doesn't say I'm responsible for you actually listening. But I can put those things on myself and say, oh yeah, nobody heard what I said, nobody got saved. And those are all things God never asked and they make it, they, the, all that pressure makes it like, I don't wanna do this anymore. When God says no. I just want you to help them understand what it means. That's it. I'll do the rest. So unrealistic expectations. 
And then there's probably more reasons, but the last one I came up with was just, we forget that it's by his grace. (laughs) I'm not gonna do that. That's what Gideon said when he asked him, I'm not gonna go fight those guys. Uh, Did you see me, Lord, when you talked to me? I was hiding. And he calls him a mighty man of valor. Not because of what he was without God, but because what he was gonna be with God if he was willing to trust him. If God tells you to do it, he'll give you everything you need to do it. It, It's it's inconsequential how I feel about it. And the fact that I'm insufficient is what qualifies me to be used by God in the first place. So I gotta remember, it's by his grace, just as Paul told us. He tells us here, or exhorts us in this chapter, operate in the giftings God's given you because we won't unless we first recognize and understand what they are and then intentionally utilize them in the ways God leads us to in our lives, knowing that this is where we and our brothers and sisters are gonna be most blessed. And that requires surrender to God's will. First, that's why he started the chapter that way. And then also the motivation that Paul gave us, remember, because of the mercies God's shown you. Because of everything God has done in your life up to this point is super good. He wants to keep doing that but you gotta stay in his will. That's where he can do it best, amen? And again, this week, we're celebrating. I'm gonna have the worship team come up here and we'll do one song here. We're gonna run a little late, but I wanna give you guys a chance to respond. So this week we're celebrating, today's Palm Sunday, right? We're celebrating Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem before he's crucified. But remember, one of the reasons he died on that cross and saved you paid the price for your sins so that you could be forgiven of them and you could be made right, brought into a relationship with God was so he could change you. The will of God is to change us. Remember back in Romans 8, right? You were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God is changing you to be like Jesus. And all these attributes, all these these gifts, that's, that's who Jesus is. So when we're operating in our gifts, we are being like Jesus. That's the goal. We surrender, then we know God's will, then we rely on his grace to live it out in our lives. We do what he says, and he changes us to be like Jesus. And we shouldn't need convincing for that to happen because it's who Jesus is that saved us in the first place, right? We saw how loving he was. We saw how kind and merciful he was. We saw how awesome every attribute of him was. And the more we learn about Jesus in his word, the more we fall in love with him. That is who we want to be. And when we're, these these things God's gifted us in, that's what we're doing. We're being Jesus. We're being transformed, amen? Amen. So a couple things I want you to think of during this response time. Number one, what are your giftings? And again, you shouldn't have to think too hard. How are you naturally bent? Maybe some of the things I shared today, maybe other things. And then the bigger question, and this is the one I want you to bring before the Lord, we all need to do this, often in our lives. Even as I talked about last week, laying yourself down as a sacrifice on the altar, how we're alive, living sacrifices. We squirm off the altar. Every day we gotta put ourselves back on. But every day you gotta go before the Lord and like, am I where you want me to, Lord? Am I doing what you want? Am I in your will, not my will? Are you utilizing the giftings God's given you the way he wants you to? Because again, if you're not, every single one of us in here is being affected detrimentally. I'm not saying that to lay a guilt trip on you, but that's the reality. We're missing out, because we need you. And then you're missing out, because that is where you're gonna be most satisfied in life. You're not living until you're living for Jesus. And that is when you're most living for him, when you're right where he wants you to be. And maybe that's a word for some of you. Maybe you're here visiting today and you haven't given your life to the Lord and you recognize like these things like, like purpose, significance, belonging, they're all things you're looking for and you're not finding it in life and you're not going to. I was there, I spent 20 years of my life and that was a tired, 
tired cycle of just trying to find those things in everything else in this world and being constantly disappointed until I found what I was looking for in Jesus Christ. And today, you can place your faith in him. We'll have people around the room you can come up and pray with. We'll lead you in a prayer. And you can receive him as your Lord and Savior. You can be forgiven of your sin, made right with God. He can come into your life, and he'll start changing you for the better, start enabling you to be who he made you to be. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much. I'm so thankful for these truths, Lord. I wouldn't believe them if you didn't say them. But because you have, and I know I need, to, I need to read it over and over again. I need to be reminded of these things. And I'm so thankful that you've given us purpose. You've given us significance that every single one of us in here, you have a plan for. And my insufficiency is inconsequential. My lack of faith, all these things, wherever I... I I lack, you are more than able to make up for. I just need to go to you. I need to surrender to you. Let you lead me into the will you have for me, into the things you want me to be doing for you, and then look to you for help, and you'll give it. And I pray right now that if there's any, any areas in our life that we're holding back from you, maybe even knowing a gifting but not doing it, doing what it is you're asking us to do for you, that you bring those to our attention. May we come surrendered. May we know that, man, despite our understanding, despite our, what we think's best, you know what's best. You've always proven that. And may we give those things to you and just follow as you lead. In Jesus' name, amen.
That's our heart's cry, Lord. We, we just want to be where you are. Lord, we want to follow you wherever you lead. We know that it's in your good, pleasing, and perfect will where we'll, we'll sense your presence. We'll be closest to you. And so that's, that's our goal. We're just following you. And we don't always understand where you're leading us, at least at first, Lord. You're so good about showing us in hindsight why you led us where you did. And, and you're always right. We, we, that's proven to be true, but we know it to be true, Lord. You can't be wrong. So, Father, as we go from this place, may we just follow you. May we be in line with you. May we be surrendered and submitted so we can know your will. We can see the things that you've gifted us in, the, see the ways you want us to use them in the community here in our church family, in all areas of our life. Just being where you are and seeing you work, seeing the glory of God, seeing how awesome you are in our lives and, and seeing how awesome you are in other people's lives as you work through us, Lord. That's what we want. That's what we ask. And we pray these things in faith, knowing this is what you want for us, Lord. These are prayers you want to answer. So we commit your people. We commit the rest of this week. May it be a joyous week of reflecting on the cross and that our Savior isn't dead. He's alive, as we're going to celebrate next Sunday, Lord. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.